Expand Radio and C-SPAN.org. Next, historians James Oakes and John Witt discuss their new prize-winning books about the process of emancipation during the Civil War. Professor Oakes argues that contrary to conventional narratives, the destruction of slavery was a Republican goal from the beginning. John Witt discusses the world's first pamphlet-style Laws of War Code, written by Lincoln advisor and legal scholar Francis Lieber in 1862 and 1863. Witt argues that the Lieber Code was written to help justify emancipation as a military necessity, and that the code has been a source for international laws of war ever since. This Yale University discussion was moderated by the director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition, David Blight. The program is about 90 minutes. I'm David Blight, the director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition. Uh, this is one of our occasional events about the history of slavery, emancipation, its legacies, aftermath, and etc. Uh, last year we did a, a panel in this same room, I believe, on legacies of the Civil War. In fact, John Witt was on that one. We get you every year. <laughs> Um, this year, I've asked two authors of very recent, uh, important, prize-winning books to appear together, and all I have to do is introduce them, ask, I hope, a few interesting questions, and then uh, let them have at it, if that's what happens. Um, let me introduce the two speakers, and then I want to pose the first question actually in the form of two quotations. Uh, John Fabian Witt on my left uh, is the Alan H. Duffy class of 1960 professor of law here at Yale. He did BA here at Yale, uh, JD and PhD at Yale, both law and history. We claiming as, claim him as a historian in the history department. Um, he's the author of uh, three important books, First, Patriots and Cosmopolitans, Hidden Histories of American Law. Uh, then the second book, The Accidental Republic, Crippled Working Men, Destitute Widows, and the Remaking of American Law. And now uh, the current book, just out this past year, uh, Lincoln's Code, uh, The Laws of War in American History, which just recently won the Bancroft Prize, which for those of you who don't know is for a best book in all fields of American history. It's not an easy one to get. <laughs> um, and uh, John teaches uh, law courses as well as constitutional history here in, in the Yale Law School. Uh, Jim Oakes on my right uh, is distinguished professor of history and humanities, professor at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. He's previously taught at Princeton and at Northwestern. Jim is the author of numerous important books. Um, first was the book called um, The Ruling Race, A History of American Slaveholders. Uh, he started out as a scholar of the Old South and slavery, has moved ahead now to abolitionism and the Civil War. His second book, Slavery and Freedom, an Interpretation of the Old South. A third book, The Radical and the Republican, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, and the triumph of anti-slavery politics. I have at one point or another, or another taught all of those books. And now, uh, his new book, um, big new book, they're both big. You guys have worn me out the past couple of weeks, I must say. But for a good cause, um, I must say. Um, I've been sort of sizzling inside with all the originality in both of these books and bothered by only a couple of things. But, but, but anyway, uh, the new book, Freedom National, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States, 1861 to 1865, has also just won the Abraham Lincoln Prize uh, for best book in the entire era of the Civil War. And that, too, is not an easy award to get, uh, trust me. Now, uh, what makes these two books so compatible for a discussion, among other things, beyond the fact that they're both just two of the best American historians I know in this field, this broad field of the Civil War, emancipation, legal history, constitutional history. Apart from all that, uh, they are both books that are all about this huge transformation 
that came about in American history and in American constitutionalism because of the emancipation of the slaves. Now John's book goes all the way from the Age of Enlightenment and the Founders, there's an opening section about Jefferson, Washington, and Franklin, uh, and then all the way to the Philippine War of the early 20th century, but the, the middle 200 pages of the book is, is about the impact of emancipation on the transformation of the laws of war. I've asked both of them to do something impossible, but they're going to do it. And that is they get about three to four minutes each to say something really poignant and clever about how they conceived um, and wrote these books, how the topic evolved, may have changed in the process, uh, and then how they think about it now as a, as a general product. That's a hard thing to do, but it can actually be done. Then I'll come back and fire a first question at both of them. Uh, John, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, thank you, David, for uh, inviting me to this. It's great to be here with Jim. Um, uh, Jim and I spent uh, a lot of time in Morningside Heights some years ago talking about the things that, that uh, entered into these books. So it's a real pleasure to get to um, appear with you here to um, uh, see it on the other, on the other side, uh, as it were. Uh, th this book didn't, for me, start out as an emancipation project. Uh, I, I thought of it as a project that was going to be a history of the laws of armed conflict, which is to say the, the international law rules that purport to and try to desperately, oftentimes failing, to govern uh, combat uh, on battlefields. It was a book that I started in New York City um, in the years shortly after 9-11 when the laws of armed conflict, the laws of war suddenly seemed like an extraordinarily salient problem. Uh, there were debates about whether the laws of war meant anything, uh, whether they were just hypocrisy or whether they were a sacred pact that the United States had adhered to over the course of centuries. And I wanted to try to answer some of those, uh, some of those puzzles. And I wanted to answer them through a character, uh, uh, an old Columbia professor, I was at Columbia at the time, named Francis Lieber, who in the winter of 62-63 writes for Lincoln and the, uh, Union, and, and, the, and the Union a code of war. Uh, it's the first pamphlet-sized treatment of the laws of war, something that had been treated in European treaties and long French and Latin volumes for centuries. And for the first time, the Lincoln administration crystallizes it into a single pamphlet designed for officers to carry in the field. And the, the puzzle of Lieber and his code uh, is what was the Union doing in 62-63 crafting a set of rules that might constrain their actions uh, in the field? Why would the side with a, uh, the upper hand in terms of pure military force, at just the moment it's decided to throw off the early Rosewater strategy of the war, why would that side promulgate a set of rules purporting to constrain itself? Uh, and the answer I came to led me to emancipation and turned this book into a book that was about emancipation much more than I ever would have guessed that it, uh, that it might have been. Although it may be that given that I was a David Brian Davis student uh, as an undergraduate and a graduate student, that I should have expected that all of my work would turn into work about slavery in one form uh, or, or another because of his, uh, because of his influence. Uh, and the, the, the answer that I came to to solve this puzzle, I've, uh, I've come to and, and um, I hope is right. Uh, I've written it down and now it's not fixable. Uh, uh, is that it's the imperatives of emancipation that produce this text. Uh, emancipation is not just a great moral moment in the politics of the United States. It's also an extraordinarily complicated moment in the history of the laws of war. Uh, it took an aggressive position in a complicated, long-standing problem of slavery and wartime. And the Lincoln administration felt the need to legitimate and justify this dangerous intervention into the private social life of the South, one that had lots of law of war critics. Uh, and this produced a code which was about all the things we think of about as being about the laws of war, prisoners of war, torture, civilian targets, all the things that the laws of war entail now, but also produced a code that was about slavery and the arming of black soldiers, and that this was the source of the, um, uh, of, of the, of the, um, of the Lincoln's uh, Law of War Code. Now, it also turns out, and I think I'm probably coming to the end of my three minutes, but it also turns out, I've come to think, that the Law of War story reilluminates emancipation, and that the emancipation moment looks different once one sees it in, as part of this Law of War story, because it means that the Law of War wasn't merely enabling 
the Emancipation Proclamation. We've long thought of it as having done so, uh, especially after Jim's book really emphasizing very nicely, uh, beautifully, this uh, the, the law of war military power uh, idea. Military necessity is, in, is right there in the Emancipation Proclamation itself. But the law of war wasn't just empowering, it was also providing and delivering a set of constraints and limits, uh, constraints and limits that we can talk about at greater length across the course of this session that show up both in, in the text of, the, of the, the, um, the Union Field Manual on the Walls of War, but also in the final Emancipation Proclamation itself, and might even filter through to Reconstruction. So that's the that's how I came to this. It was a it was an, uh, an accidental arrival at emancipation, but then, as David says, emancipation became really the center, the moral center and the historical center of of, of the book. Jim. Okay, see if I can do this. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be back. To talk to John. It's always fun to talk to John. Um, I'm a historian. I have long-term, medium-term, and short-term origins for my book. Uh, about 25 years ago, I had a conversation with uh, Ken Stamp, who had been my dissertation advisor. I had published a speculative essay on the, uh, on the uh, political significance of slave resistance during the Civil War, and I was talking to him saying, I would like to keep going and trace the connections between what Lincoln is doing in Washington and what the slaves are doing on the ground. And he was sort of say, uh, he was skeptical, didn't think. I would find the evidence and it took me 25 years to answer the skepticism. So that's, it's been percolating in a long, for a long time in the back of my mind as a problem. Um, when I finished the last book, as I was writing my last book on Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, I, I, uh, the, the, the climax of that book in some ways is the three meetings Lincoln has with Frederick Douglass. And the second one struck me because it's the summer of 1864. Lincoln thinks he's going to lose the election. It's a low point for him and the Republicans. He calls Frederick Douglass back to the White House and he says, the slaves aren't running to union lines as much as I'd hoped. Basically, if I lose this election, if the Republicans lose, we're going to end the war without slavery having been fully abolished. And I need to get as many slaves emancipated as possible before this terrible thing, this is my loss, <laughs> in the election happens. And Frederick Jones agreed with him. And I was thinking about that and thinking, well, if that's true, if these two guys agree in August of 1864 that it's not over, that, that there's a distinct possibility that the war is going to end without slavery having been abolished, then there's something wrong with many of the narratives we've been telling, uh, the stories we've been telling about emancipation. There's a, a kind of a version of a Lincoln-centered narrative that says he freed all the slaves with the stroke of his pen as soon as he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. There's a social history narrative that says, you know, by the time he got around to issuing the proclamation, no force on earth could prevent this from happening. And I wanted to see why it was taking so long what were the obstacles and and so I went into this book with uh, the primary intention of explaining why it took so long and what what it was that explains why it took so long to get slavery abolished um, along the way to my surprise I discovered that it actually even took longer than I expected that that uh, it's not simply the aftermath of the proclamation that was the big story for me it turned out to be the origins uh, I bumped into what I call the anti-slavery origins of the Civil War and discovered far more anti-slavery in the Republican Party at the moment the war began, and I saw far more anti-slavery policy than I had expected to find, and so it was the origins as well as the aftermath of the proclamation that the book ultimately became. And uh, as we will see uh, in the conversation, uh, my book on traces a line of uh, 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 back into the 18th century to look at the anti-slavery origins of the Civil War of the Emancipation Proclamation and John's book traces a line back into the 18th century on the w laws of war origins and the books literally converge at, at Lincoln's Code, at the Libra Code and to my great relief and I, I got the impression to your great relief we basically agreed on what, <laughs> what the relationship <laughs> between those two were. So uh, it ended up not quite on everything. Not on everything. There's other ways in which we disagree. We'll talk about those. But um, but uh, so the book has uh, it's been percolating in my mind for a long time. It was immediately prompted by the last book I wrote, and it changed dramatically over the course of my writing. Thank you, both of you. Uh, that that meeting between Douglas and Lincoln in '64. It's That's still it, well. It still astonishes people, you know, yeah. publicly when they when they hear about it. Here's Abraham Lincoln asking Frederick Douglass to help him get as many slaves out of the South as possible before right. the election, right. and 
I think we agree that Douglas was stunned. Um, right. Right. <laughs> partly because he wasn't sure how the hell he was going to do it, but that's another matter. All right, I want to I want to I want to read a, a simple quotation for each of you. They're from your books. They're not by you. They're by your subjects. The first is from Francis Lieber, and I just want both of you to comment on them. The more vigorously wars are pursued, the better it is for humanity. What did Lieber mean by that? And that's also a way I hope you'll tell us a little more about Lieber. I mean, he's kind of the light motif in your book. Uh, and he's such, his life is such an amazing trajectory. So your quote, Jim, comes from a little-known Republican congressman from Maine named John Rice, although it could have been any one of another three dozen Republicans whom you quote. By the laws of peace, slavery was entitled to protection and had it. But by the laws of war, it is entitled to annihilation. You go first. Uh, so uh, this Francis Lieber character uh, uh, has been forgotten by most, most everyone. Uh, Jim is helping to bring him back. I hope I'm helping to bring him back a little bit. The people who have not forgotten Francis Lieber and have not uh, uh, for you know, a century now are international lawyers and military lawyers. And the international lawyers have for uh, you know, more than 100 years now sought to champion Lieber as a, a forward-looking humanitarian. He's someone who anticipated the humanitarian constraints on this view uh, of, of 20th century international law. And we can see some residues of Lieber in the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and in modern uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, Lieber is a very difficult character, to, once you get to know him, to actually assimilate into this humanitarian story. He's someone who's uh, born in Prussia, fights against uh, Napoleon at Waterloo, is horribly injured and left for dead on a field chasing Napoleon back to Paris in 1815, uh, finds his way to the United States where he becomes one of, the, one of the leading public intellectuals of the day, a garrulous public intellectual uh, who causes controversy wherever he goes because he won't stop talking. He just keeps going, writing and talking. Um, and is a, is a fascinating character. And at the moment of the Civil War, finds himself as one of the leading thinkers. Uh, he's written a good deal in the 1830s about the laws of war. The unusual thing about Lieber, though, is that he's not uh, a, a, an inheritor of an Enlightenment tradition running, oh, through uh, the, a Swiss jurist named Emmerich de Vattel, through Franklin and Jefferson uh, to into the 19th century. He's instead a student and disciple of Karl von Clausewitz, the Prussian theorist of modern total warfare. And Lieber, like Clausewitz, like maybe Machiavelli or Frederick the Great before him, is a theorist of how states exercise power. Uh, and, and warfare for Lieber is one of the ways that civilization renews itself. Uh, it's not to be taken on lightly. He's no warmonger, but it's something that civilizations need to engage in in order to avoid decay and uh, de uh, decadence and uh, decline into vice and luxury. The greatest societies on Lieber's view are societies that have fought civilized and honorable but forceful wars. And when he says that vigorous wars are better for humanity. He has in mind a deeply subversive critique of modern international humanitarian law, one that comes from Clausewitz, and the critique runs like this. Uh, the critique is w w wars that are fought with hands tied behind the back are wars that are more likely to be fought in the first place. Uh, humanitarian constraint will produce warfare because states can uh, get into war not worried about the consequences or less worried than they otherwise would be about the consequences. And there are wars that will drag on. And wars that drag on and happen more frequently are worse for humanity than wars that happen so aggressively that states are wary of getting into in the first place, and they'll end sooner. Now, I describe this as a subversive critique. Uh, Lieber doesn't have the benefit of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to know, or Dresden or Tokyo for that matter, to know how short and sharp war can be. That's another one of his phrases, short and sharp war is better for humanity. But in the 1860s, uh, um, this idea holds that, that, uh, that forceful fighting, 
is better in the long run for humanity. And the key for this session, I think, is that that view of warfare coincides perfectly with what the Lincoln administration needs to be saying in 62-63, allows the Lincoln administration, and it's Halleck in particular, who's the go-between between the administration and Lieber, to have a story about humanitarianism at the same time as a story about uh, accelerating the war effort and taking off uh, the gloves in, uh, in that effort, and linking it up to emancipation, which is, a, on, on one view, one widely held view, a daunting act of violence toward the private sector of, the, of an enemy regime. Uh, so that view is a terrifying one. It's also one that runs through the 19th century. And at this moment, comes together with the Emancipation Project and the Military Strategy Project of the Lincoln administration and propels the laws of war into the modern world. Henry Halleck, by the way, was general in chief, right? Of, of uh, by this point, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Jim, do you need that quote again? Or I think you probably. No, I know that quote. <laughs> um, <laughs> it comes from. Uh, the debates over the Second Confiscation Act, I think, right? So it's in the spring of 1862, and uh, among other things, it demonstrates a point I, I alluded to in my earlier remarks, but can, uh, can press further here, that uh, long before there was an Emancipation Proclamation, the Republicans were talking about the complete destruction of slavery, uh, uh, that the, uh, they come into the secession crisis warning that if the South secedes from the Union, they're going to lose all the protection the Constitution gives them, uh, gives slavery, and th that rather than a peaceful, gradual abolition state by state, what you're going to get if you actually proceed by, uh, with secession is a violent, brutal, swift military emancipation. Now, this was a, a tradition that uh, uh, at least historically, it had long, it it's goes all the way back through history that, that uh, belligerents emancipate slaves uh, a, as a weapon of war. So it's not as though the Republicans were threatening to do something no one had ever heard of. Uh, but as, as a kind of legal intellectual tradition among the anti-slavery people, uh, it's most often associated with uh, the, the interventions John Quincy Adams makes during the gag rule debates uh, in which he says, uh, uh, the, the Southerners are insisting that the, 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 that the federal government has no power to intervene in any way in the s states where slavery exists. And John Quincy Adams says, well, that's not entirely true. If there is a war, the war powers do empower the federal government to go into the South and begin emancipating slaves. And it's not the, a dominant tradition in anti-slavery thought, but it's there. And the reason it's not a dominant tradition is because they weren't anticipating war. They, they didn't, they, they, it was sort of, if anything, it was the threat behind uh, their proposals for gradual state-by-state -state abolition was they're never going to secede because if they do, this is what's going to come down. And it comes bubbling to the surface very clearly during the secession crisis when they, when they say, look, if you leave, this is what you're going to get. And by, uh, they, start out, they start out with a certain amount of abolition almost immediately. They start emancipating certain kinds of slaves. But by 1862, the gloves are off. They're switching to the kind of hard war policy that you're talking about. And part of that hard war policy is the commitment to u universal emancipation in the rebellious states. And that's what he's saying. Under the, under the laws of peace, we can't do this. Under the laws of war, we can annihilate slavery. This is one of the, if, if you read these books, it, it, it seems like common sense on one hand that, of course, the Civil War, once it comes, opens doors, right? use the door metaphor, I think, at times. It opens a huge door. To, to, I mean, the war makes all things possible, uh, in a way. You both say that at times. Um, but let, let's go back to that first year of the war, because the argument you're making is that emancipation is happening much earlier than we sometimes right. believe, right. or used to believe, uh, that it's happening by military means, uh, and that it, and it's happening more aggressively than, than we've perhaps believed, and that Lincoln himself is on board earlier than, yeah. than we... He's quiet about it, but he signs all he, the laws. Right, he's he, quiet he, about it. He, he but could you talk... I mean, I've never read anything that so clearly explains... It doesn't sound so sexy, but it's terribly important. The First and Second Confiscation Act. So the First Confiscation Act, 
uh, made law in August of 1861, the second Confiscation Act, right. so much bigger, so right. much more important, right. Right. the following well, the, year. Well, again, I'll go back to the, the, my, my opening remarks about how the book changed. I started the book with the standard place most, most books about emancipation these days start, which is I wrote a chapter on Fortress Monroe right. and but Benjamin Butler. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to have to write. Do what happened there? What happened there for our? Oh, you don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, covering uh, uh, about uh, uh, about six weeks after the war begins, uh, three slaves run to Union lines at Fortress Monroe. Benjamin Butler is the Union general. He's just arrived and he's in charge of it. And he looks out over the parapets and says, "Look at these. We can't send these guys back because the Confederates are over there on the other side of the of Hampton Roads using these slaves to build fortifications that they're going to use to." attack us. And he was right. That's what they were doing. So he says, I think I'm going to keep them. I'm not going to send them back. And when, his, when the owner sends his representative and says, you have to bring them back as uh, you are obliged under the terms of the Fugitive Slave Act to give us these slaves back, Benjamin Butler says to him, in classic anti-slavery formulation, well, that was true if that would be true if you were in the Union under the Constitution, but the Fugitive Slave Act doesn't apply to a foreign country, which Virginia claims to be. So it's the first indication that the threat that that they had been making, uh, that if you leave the Union, you lose the constitutional protection, is actually going to be imposed. Now, he keeps the slaves. They get, he doesn't call them yet contraband of war, but that's what they get called very rapidly. They get, they get understood. To, that, that's the term of popular choice anyway. They don't use it much in the military or in official official communication. But the press, but the press, press picks press. it up right away and starts calling them contraband of war. I think ironically, actually. but. Um, but uh, the Lincoln administration, he sends these telegrams to the Lincoln administration, to his boss back in, uh, in Washington, and says, what am I going to do? I, I kept them. Is this the right thing to do? Lincoln says, this is a big deal. We got to we got to deal with this. There's all sorts of implications. The cabinet meets on May 30th, and then the Secretary of War sends, sends uh, Butler uh, uh, a very short but very significant uh, telegram saying, you are, your decision is approved. You may keep all slaves who run within your lines. It doesn't emancipate them, but uh, it's the first step. As you say, it's commonly understood to be the first step. Um, um, the next step, after I finished that, the only peculiarity in the way I, 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 the only peculiarity of that story that I found was the fact that there were so many press there, the fact that they were expecting this, the fact that they were writing stories as the chapter title. Isn't this still the chapter title, the fulfillment of the prophecies? Isn't this what we said was going to happen? That was a little anomaly that I still couldn't explain, but I, I went on, and the next thing was going to be the First Confiscation Act. I didn't think I'd have to do much research on the First Confiscation Act because there had been this classic study by J.G. Randall, and there were two recent books on the Confiscation Act, but they all said the First Confiscation Act didn't do anything. So I thought, well, let me just take a look, see why did they pass it if it didn't do anything. And that's where the shock came. Mm -hmm. Reading the debates in July of 1861 and seeing how thoroughly committed virtually all Republicans were to emancipation. Not complete universal emancipation yet, but to emancipation. How much they were willing to defend it, how they were willing to defend it under the laws of war, justifying it under the laws of war, how widespread it was, how often votes came up in which the Republicans voted almost unanimously in favor of various anti-slavery uh, resolutions and, and, and amendments and things like that. That surprised me. Yeah. That really surprised me. And that was the turning point of the book. I said, well, they can't have just said this, started talking this way in July of 1861. The next chapter I wrote was the secession chapter where I found all that stuff. And I said, well, they can't have just started saying this then, and I ended up back in the 18th century. Can, can I ask you there, both of you, actually? I have been struck from both books, and also a recent book by Lou Mazur called Lincoln's 100 Days, um, how much this language of military necessity right. is all over the culture, in the press, outside political right. circles, right. in the summer of 1861 right. into 1862, and, and, and so often in our teaching and in our scholarship, we've often associated this term military necessity solely with Lincoln because he actually uses the term Emancipation Proclamation. And therefore, slavery is, I mean, emancipation is only happening out of, only happening out of military necessity. But military, both it's, of you It's controversial. Work, it's that's controversial, but it also has a certain moral weight to the way people well, are, that's what are using John's it. John's book is very good on that. I in the first year of the war, which... I don't think I ever really understood right. that when they used the term military necessity, they were beginning to understand if, if we want to win this war, 
we have to free slaves. Well, the, the, the term is a term that goes back to the Middle Ages, the just war Catholic, uh, Catholic just war theory. Uh, what's striking about its resurgence at this time mm. is that it's after a hundred years of efforts by, uh, by jurists in Europe and in the United States, statesmen uh, and jurists, uh, to diminish the role of military necessity. Military necessity is a terrible warrant for dangerous things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, is, um, uh, it is embraced at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th by uh, the German military mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a rationale for breaking through humanitarian constraints. That's what its modern legacy is uh, in the 20th century, in the era of, of total warfare. Uh, and so for the, Lincoln, for the Republican Party, for the Lincoln administration and the Union Army to adopt military necessity in 1861, 62, 63 is to to cut against the grain of a hundred years of, of, of effort to develop narrower constraints and collars on what it is that armies could do in civilized warfare. And one of the ironies here is one of the reasons the military necessity uh, idea causes such acute problems in 62-63 is that American statesmen had been at the lead, at the forefront, from the, from the, the, uh, from the founders onward, uh, in an effort to make military necessity subordinate to, to uh, hard and fast rules that were limits on what militaries could do. The protection of private property, for example, and the protection of slavery are areas where American statesmen were out in front trying from the early republic onward to create hard and fast rules that would limit what civilized armies could do in the face of a military necessity tradition that went back into, uh, into the Middle Ages. And so that's what, what causes such controversy about uh, military necessity in 62-63. It's what I think calls forth the effort to think systematically about the laws of war in this moment, and it's what makes emancipation such a da morally dangerous and legally dangerous thing, even as it's uh, powerfully warranted by moral injunctions and military necessity itself. Mm. Lest we not get to it, Lincoln, um, you still got to say something about the Second Confiscation Act, because okay. it, it is so important. Uh, July 1862, passed by Congress. Uh, after long and bitter debate, uh, which in effect emancipates a lot of slaves. And all rebel-owned slaves. All rebel-owned slaves. In, in areas formerly occupied or by right. the Confederacy. Right. Now, Lincoln's role in this, I, I want both of you to comment because I do think you have some divergence on that. Uh, you, you find really not much, to ca tell me if I'm correct, you don't really find much of an evolution from one place to another in Lincoln's conception of this problem, as opposed to other scholars who have said, namely Eric Foner most recently and dozens of others, that Lincoln can only be understood in emancipation for his growth from one place to another. Oh, I don't think another. that's what Eric's book, Eric's book says. Okay, okay, well, say what you say. And then, I think Eric's book says that there is Eric later. that he always hated slavery. Slavery isn't what he needed to evolve about. It was right. race. It was that that's where he evolved, right? So it's not his anti-slavery convictions. I actually think, in some ways, more than Eric, that there is an evolution in his thinking, but that the evolution in his thinking is just he's evolving along with the Republicans mm -hmm. toward an increasingly aggressive approach to slavery, mm -hmm. not from no. Yeah. Not from reluctance to emancipate to willingness to emancipate, right. but from a relatively limited emancipation right. to a universal emancipation. He's going through that same process as the Republicans are. Some are getting there faster, some are getting mm -hmm. there slower. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to figure, it's hard to make that difference align with radicals and conservatives. So that mm -hmm. you frequently quote Orville Browning. He's one of the most conservative Republicans there is. He's also one of the most aggressive advocates of virtually unrestrained presidential power. Right? So, and uh, Lincoln is not where Browning is, and neither are most Republicans. Right? Mm -hmm. In the debates over the Second Confiscation Act, for example, the, the thing that divides Republicans on emancipation more than anything else in those debates is whether or not Congress can and force the president, can force right. the president right. to issue a proclamation emancipating all the slaves, or whether the logic of military necessity requires that it be done at his discretion as 
commander in chief. Right? And Browning is saying, is taking a position way out in left field, saying, we don't need this law at all. He has all the power he needs. What's the president do? Yeah, the president can do anything he damn well please. But he takes the Dick Cheney position, basically. Mm. <laughs> so, okay. so he's not representative of Republicans. He's not representative of Lincoln. He's, he's way, right from the start, he's way off. But isn't it interesting that, I mean, Confiscation Act not only frees several categories of slaves, but in effect it calls on the president to do a proclamation. Yes. That's why. I, I, think, that's, one, I think that's part of the Second Confiscation Act that, that either doesn't get into textbooks or that we, we don't we well, that's know partly fully. Because, partly it's a because very complicated law. It's, got it's, because, it's, it's because the law is so ambiguous, yeah. and even where it's in Section 6, it's not it clear. It actually challenges him in effect or authorizes him. Well, everybody's talking about it. It's right, in the right, press. Right. It's in the letters mm -hmm. to him. When mm -hmm. are you going to issue this proclamation? So it's one of the reasons that uh, I don't worry about when did Lincoln decide to free the slaves. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. It's just everybody is moving in this direction. Mm -hmm. Congress passes this law on the 7th. He signs the law on the 17th. It's a Thursday, right? He goes over to the soldiers. I don't room. remember. I wasn't it's there. the last it's day of Thursday. Congress. It's, it's no, interesting. No, I'm sure. It's the last day of Congress. It's the last day of a very long and very productive session. Congress passed a slew of laws. The Militia Act gets passed on the 17th, for example. And, and as was the case in the 19th century, it's not so much the case anymore. When Congress goes out of session, it's not going to come back for six months. It, a lot of the laws it passes require presidential proclamations. Yeah. So he goes off to the soldiers' home right after Congress leaves, and he scribbles out a whole bunch of proclamations and presidential authorizations for the laws that Congress has just passed, and one of them is a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. The first draft, and he goes to the cabinet meeting a few days later, it takes two days to go through all the different proclamations. It that takes this mysticism out of Lincoln having his inspiration moment, yeah. sitting in the War Department right. saying, everybody, I everybody will back. write a proclamation. I mean, yeah, I it's, it's, well, it's part of Let's put a little, let's put a little you're mysticism back in. a certain moment that I want to ask Yeah, you. so I, I, I think there, there's an important difference Harrison between, uh, well, there's an important difference between um, First Emancipation uh, Act, se First Confiscation Act, Second Confiscation Act, and then the Emancipation Proclamation. So the Second Confiscation Act does not go as far as Lincoln does. In some ways, it goes further, but it's, 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 but it's a different legal theory uh, and reflects uh, maybe an evolving notion of what the laws of war authorize. So the Second Confiscation Act is for disloyal owners. Disloyal owners. The Emancipation Proclamation is for territories. Right. Uh, and it right. matters not what the status of the owner is vis-a-vis -vis the rebellion. Now that's an important difference. The disloyal ownership idea continues to connect up emancipation to some notion of treason or confiscation as a result of violation of the constitutional deal, the pact, uh, the, the social compact. The Link Lincoln's move in moving to the proclamation is to end all possibility that there will be disputes and adjudications after the fact of whether or not someone was disloyal. Uh, um, we've moved moves to a purely military emancipation in which the fact of being a slave in a designated territory uh, means you've been freed. The now, territory I, has to be disloyal. Yeah, he has to designate yeah, it as right, disloyal. So, there, so it doesn't disconnect it totally from the loyalty well, but, question. But it means, um, you know, it, it, it dis disconnects it from the status of the owner. Right, the Second Confiscation Act continues to track on the status of the person, free or slave, uh, uh, to the to the loyalty of the owner. And with the Emancipation Proclamation, this is this is no longer a question. Now, um, uh, it is complicated to figure out the difference between these two things. Uh, the difference, and one of the brilliant parts of Jim's book on the First Emancip First Confiscation Act, is that these differences get lost in practice. I mean, that is to say, fine differences like this in the field. Are, are almost not differences at all, and and and, uh, and we see this here really beautifully in Cameron's instructions. Following this is from Jim's book, not mine, from the First Confiscation Act. Cameron's instructions to the Army. Simon Cameron Cameron's still the Secretary, Secretary of War, of War. Uh, and Cameron elides all the fine legal distinctions in the First Confiscation Act and produces something that's emancipating lots more slaves than uh, the, the Confiscation Act, the first one, ever contemplated. So these distinctions can get lost, but I think they're important to understand the evolution of the legal theory. Uh, and, and the difference isn't, isn't nothing. You're impressed what is the difference? I mean, well, I mean, I mean, other yeah. than that legal technical dis distinction, because uh, th there is an argument that get, it crops up in the 13th Amendment debates. Lyman Trumbull is particularly critical of Lincoln for shifting from a, 
a loyal person's criteria to a loyal area's, because he said, we wouldn't have this problem in the border states right now if you'd have kept it the way it is, because for all practical purposes, we all know by 1860, the spring of 1862, we all knew that there's no such thing as a loyal slaveholder for all practical purposes. Doing, making loyal slaveholders slaves free is the same as freeing all the slaves in any given area. What Lincoln does by shifting that criteria is restrict emancipation and make the, pro the border states a real problem by 1864, that it wouldn't have been had he kept it the way it was. Now, I think he's actually retroactively inventing a criticism that, uh, that no one could have imagined at the time. Yeah. But it's not obvious to me that the practical effect of that distinction is in any way meaningful. Well, so no, I, I think it is in the following way. The, the move to territory away from, from status of owner is a move to fully embrace, for the first time, the war theory. Disloyal, loyal are not categories from war. War is enemy uh, and, and citizen. Uh, it's enemy and friend. Carl Schmitt's terms, uh, uh, the, 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 the status of the owner is, has the persistence of the idea of domestic congressional authority. Uh, and it's Lincoln who makes the move to beyond that. Uh, it, it shores up the legal theory. It ends the risk of, of interminable litigation over the status of owners uh, in the aftermath of the war. It may produce this border I, state I problem. I don't think it does. But, uh, but, but that's the important difference. I think it's a legal difference, but in practical terms, I don't think that one way or the other was going to free more slaves versus, I, don't, I think, that in practical terms, since neither of them was going to work in the long run, in practical terms, I don't see, I don't see the difference. Okay. The legal difference, I agree. Right. Oh, okay, I want to keep pushing you a little further. It's a long war. Um, <laughs> um, Lincoln is up against, Lincoln and the Republicans are up against enormous obstacles. Um, you're in, in, in one case, his commanding general, McClellan, George McClellan, who frankly didn't want to free anybody uh, if he could help it. Now, you're impressed with a particular meeting, a moment, Harrison's Landing, I think it's July 11, 1862, Lincoln, this is after McClellan's horrible defeat in the Battle of the Seven Days, humiliating defeat. He goes down there and meets with McClellan, and what does McClellan do but reads him in effect, a letter, a long letter, telling him this war cannot be made against slavery. And you say that's a real turning point for Lincoln, or yeah. among the turning points for Lincoln. Yeah, I think it's one of He comes back from that and realizes, oh dear, um, i got to go further. It's one of the moments where uh, Lincoln and the, and the Union run into a powerful counter tradition to the Republican Party views that Jim brilliant, brilliantly articulates in, the, in this great book. Uh, the counter tradition was the view that freeing enemy slaves was among the worst sins a civilized state could engage in in, in warfare. Uh, to free enemy slaves was to stir up servile insurrection. Uh, it was to, to, I mean, it was for one thing, it was to take enemy private property, which was something that American statesmen were at pains to try to set outside of the scope of battlefield conduct, and which is today an illegitimate target, absent some military target that's the, um, that's the center of the, uh, of the military campaign. And northerners of all stripes believed servile war was going to happen, right? They believed there were going to be slaves. Yeah, it's not we, clear to me what they meant when they said No, it's true. Yeah. Well, it's not clear anybody. Some ever. of them just meant the slaves were going to run away in large numbers. That's all it meant. But there was this expectation. Yeah, yeah. There was a right, right. And, and you know, we see this in military strategists in Europe and North America in the 1840s and 50s. The European militaries know how they'll win a war against the United States. Uh, there's a there's a tinderbox uh, sitting there on the southern half of the United States, uh, and it's part of military strategy conversations uh, in, in the decades leading up to the, to the war. And so when McClellan says at Harrison's Landing in July of 62, uh, says, Mr. President, what civilized armies don't do is free enemy slaves. He's tapping into a tradition that runs back to Jefferson in 1776, 77, uh, Lord Dunmore, uh, who proclaimed slaves free in Virginia in 1775. He's going back to a tradition of Washington watching British ships take slaves away in 1783 from New York. John Quincy Adams, as an earlier politician, is part of this tradition when he criticizes the British for carrying off slaves after the War of 1812. And that tradition is an extraordinarily powerful one alongside this idea that war is an emancipating occasion. Uh, and so that's the tradition that Lincoln runs into uh, at Harrison's Landing in July of, of 1862. And, and it's, the, it's the meeting that, in my view, propels uh, the emancipation decision shortly thereafter, a decision that's rooted squarely in the laws of war and not in the disloyal, loyal uh, uh, categories from, from domestic law. Um.
two things. One is that I, I, when I went back, it seems to me uh, even McClellan, as I don't like McClellan any more than Jim McPherson does, but, but uh, it does seem to me that even in the Harrison Landing letter, McClellan has come to accept certain kinds of emancipation as legitimate, right? And he didn't, what he didn't want is this shift to this universal emancipation policy. He had uh, accepted uh, some slavery. He had accepted, he had to. well, he had to. He would have been violating the law otherwise. I mean, the Congress passes the Articles of War two days before the first boats leave Alexandria or something like that. He's in Washington. He knows it's going on. He can't order his men to break the law, and so they don't. Um, He's a, he committed a lot of other insubordination. <laughs> anyway, go he's ahead. not a criminal. He's not a no, traitor, right, but he's, right, right. he's not anti-slavery. But, uh, but um, go ahead. He's just a lousy general. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other thing I would I, I, this is one of the things. The other tradition you're talking about. Uh, uh, it seems to me uh, this is where we had this email exchange a long time ago, uh, and uh, about. Not so much John Quincy Adams, it became about John Quincy Adams. When did he change his mind and was it a complete change of mind and stuff like that. But really, for me, it's now about... see what historians really do. <laughs> really, for me, it's about, about the status of, that, of the emancipatory tr tradition in your book versus my book. And this is where I think there is a, is a divergence. Um, in, my, in your book, there is an enlightenment interpretation of war that says you can't touch property. In my view, the Enlightenment is a contested tradition, and one of the contested traditions is that slaves are not legitimate property. They're persons. That they're persons, and, the, and that this, this, is the, this is the argument that the British absolutely will not give up in, at the Treaty of Paris, in the Jay Treaty, in the Treaty of Ghent. They will not give that position up. So that in your book, the, what I think, see, think of as the pro-slavery tradition becomes the Enlightenment tradition, when for me, there are two Enlightenment traditions in contestation with one another, and the anti-slavery one takes control of the federal government in 1861, and suddenly, boom, 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 you get a series of anti-slavery moves coming out of Congress. The, the, the difficulty yeah. is, um, to, to two things in response, the difficulty is that it's American statesmen, undifferentiated by section or party, who have led the pro, the, the, the pro slavery strand of this Enlightenment thesis, such that for 90 years, uh, the, the American statesmen have had one position, with the exception of the elder John Quincy Adams. And that position is one that's highly critical of uh, seizing slaves in wartime. So that it, it wouldn't be a problem for the British to adopt the view in 1862 that slavery can, can be ended in wartime. It's a distinct problem for American statesmen for this reason. And one, one piece of evidence for the continuing difficulty is Benjamin Butler, who in May of 61 is taking in the soon to be called contrabands uh, in, at Fortress Monroe. But in May of 62 is turning away slaves from Union lines, taking in some to be sure Sure, he can't help but do that, but turning away slaves uh, in Louisiana uh, and writing back to uh, the War Department uh, to seek to justify this and to defend it um, uh, as something critical to, to Union policy. Now, he gets quickly overridden in this, uh, but the question of whether or not the Union Army will adopt this emancipation strategy uh, is still one that's a very live question uh, into, the, into the middle of 1862. Well, I, I, I don't dispute what the American, what we call the American position is, but I think it understates the significance of the alternative tradition in U.S. history. This, and it, it's, it's the, the, you know, the thing that struck me when I went back and just rediscovered the anti-slavery origin is this, there's no anti-slavery origins in your book, but there's no anti-slavery, anti-slavery origins have disappeared from the historiography pretty much. And so for not, me, not in I, no, but that's, 30 Richard, years Sewell, ago. Richard Sewell, my mentor in graduate right, school, wrote a book called Ballots for Freedom yeah, in 1970. With a chapter called Freedom National. Which he's modeling so, to some so, extent. But, but my point is, I think that Somerset Blackstone tradition is very, very significant in American history. That slavery didn't just melt away in the northern states. There, there is a north because of that tradition. That is, even the Supreme Court of Massachusetts uses that Somerset logic to justify its positions in the Quack Walker cases. That is what 
the abolitionists in New York have to put forward as their justification against the pro-slavery position. In New Jersey, it comes up again later in Ohio, it comes up in Indiana, it comes up in Illinois. They have to make that argument that under the, the normal natural condition of human beings is freedom. Right? And we wouldn't be sitting here today if that wasn't significant, because if that wasn't significant, there'd be no slave states and no free states, there would have been no civil war, and as I said to one of my students in the car coming up, we'd all be writing books about the Albigensian heresy instead of the war. <laughs> because that, I think that that tradition is very, very significant in American history, even if the, f and then the question becomes the Fehrenbacher question, or the Leonard Richards question. How come that tradition that becomes uh, subordinated in national politics to the pro-slavery position. Right. And the only, the only twist on that that I'd make is that that Somerset Blackstone tradition, Somerset is a case from the end of the 18th century where a slave uh, who's forcibly kidnapped to be sent back to the United States, I mean, I say slave, but I've, deci I've decided the outcome by saying that, uh, a man in England is forcibly kidnapped to send back to uh, Virginia, uh, and the British courts uh, Lord Mansfield, writing for the British courts, uh, concludes that you can't do that. You can't seize. Now, what exactly Mansfield said is still disputed uh, today. We're still trying to figure that out, which is part of the problem. But uh, that tradition is important and only comes to fruition with the Emancipation Proclamation. It doesn't come to fruition in the Second Confiscation Act, which does not adopt the logic of Somerset uh, and Mansfield's, uh, you know, the, the, the strongest reading of what Mansfield is doing uh, uh, in, in Britain in the, seven, in the 17, um, 18th century. Okay, I have. I want to get to Q and A, but I have to ask you, Jim. Okay. Uh, and John, please weigh in too about race, about uh, colonization. Uh, colonization—the idea that that blacks, if emancipated, would be generally would would have been voluntarily removed from the United States or deported, depending on or deported. Well, there, there could have been two ways, right. but principally, the Lincoln administration favored voluntary colonization. This has always been one of the most difficult and complicated and confusing parts of Lincoln's legacy about emancipation. Why does he authorize his administration? And there are some in his cabinet much more in favor of it than others, uh, Bates, uh, Montgomery Blair, and so forth. But we have a Lincoln who is still vehemently arguing for the removal of blacks from the country in August of 1862 and that infamous meeting with five black leaders, um, which you treated in an interesting way that I'd like to hear you talk about. And we still have Lincoln arguing for colonization in his annual message of December 1862. At the same time, they're authorized, they're, at the very moment, actually, they have Lieber coming to Washington to write this code. I think it's almost, well, actually, he gives the annual message just before Lieber. Lieber's writing this code to justify this revolution they're about to enact. At the same time, Lincoln is still arguing for colonizing blacks out of the country. Um, how do you square all of that, especially for a general audience that um, doesn't know all the details? Well, the, the simplest way is colonization presupposes emancipation. Yeah, you have to be emancipating people before you can colonize. So that the fact that they True go t together makes perfect sense to me. It's not anything that requires mm -hmm. special explanation for me. But it, you don't, sometimes you, you are don't... explaining it by, you know, that this is some sort of appeasement to, you call them the part Midwestern of, racist. Part, partly it's that. I mean, it's a lot of things. Uh, I think Lincoln genuinely believed that Americans were so irredeemably racist that the best thing would be for blacks to voluntarily leave okay. the country and go somewhere else. I think he genuinely believed no, and that. And that's what you argue. That's yeah. what you said. He also did it strategically. You could mm -hmm. believe something and then use it strategically. I don't think Fair the enough. two arguments are mm -hmm. incompatible with one another. Mm -hmm. there is, it's, it's hard for me to read the way that meeting went and not think there's an element of... Yeah. This is a meeting where Lincoln calls or he has his staff call five so-called black leaders from around right. Washington to the White House, August 14, 1862, and does not have a conversation with them. Doesn't. He preaches at them. Right. He, he says the war is only happening because of the presence of black right. people. Right. And he tries to recruit these five men right. to become the leaders. It's what of you called once Lincoln's worst racial moment. I, you're right, right I did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I still think is, it is. It is. It, it is, is the worst racial He tries to recruit them to be leaders of colonization to the coal mines of Central America and then dismisses them, That's right. but invites in a reporter to cover it. Yeah, which he never did. He never did. Okay. So it's, there's an element of calculation in it. It's different yeah. from the way mo he, he saw a lot of blacks, far more than any president had ever invited mm -hmm. to the White House. He met with them, and they all go away saying he 
treated me like an equal, he listened to what I said, even when I disagreed with him. This was out of character for him, for the way he, most people had exactly the opposite problem with Lincoln. They all left the room thinking he agreed with them. You know, but, yeah. but this yeah. is, it's unusual for him, and it's hard for me not to see in that, not so much that he was telling them something he didn't believe, but that there's an element of calculation mm -hmm. in the timing and the nature of the meeting. Well, the and, moment is interesting. I mean, yeah. this is, the military moment is terrible. He's drafted the Emancipation Proclamation. He's invading the North, threatening right. Washington. Right. Uh, well, and you can see the role of, of, uh, of the, the military project here, because once mm -hmm. you've once you've armed what will eventually be almost 200,000 uh, black soldiers, uh, um, you, colonization much less of an option. Uh, you, you've you've yeah, turned yeah. these people into into citizens after the uh, proclamation, yeah. right? So so that that changes the calculus so. altogether, and and is another flashpoint in the law of war tradition. That is, this is a tradition created by Europeans for armies of, of European white soldiers. And there's a real question about what happens when people of different races are brought into uh, intra-European warfare. And it's part of the reason why the law of war runs through this all the way through the, uh, all yeah. through the war. Well, there are a dozen more questions I want to ask both of you, but I think we better get to Q&A because this is an audience that has lots of questions, I'm sure. We want you to come to the microphone, though, so that the um, recorders can... Uh... Steve, go first, and then for David. Concerning the laws of war... Are not those mics on? They're all right? Concerning the laws of war, not necessarily the military, what did Lincoln and Lieber think of both Sherman's march and also Southern renegade raiders? Did they think that was a sort of legitimate war use. And my other quick question is, were there any slaves in eastern Tennessee that were not emancipated in, say, 82, 83? Thank you. So we have I'm three questions there. I'm having to think on the first part. I'll yeah, and I'll do the, the second one. The answer is, I'm certain there were. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, so we know a lot about what Lieber thinks about the the uh, march, uh, the march on the sea, uh, and we know that because he's corresponding regularly with an officer um, uh, in in Sherman's army, uh, and and Lieber's gravely concerned about one aspect of it and not at all worried about another. The part that he's worried about is the stragglers. Uh, Lieber's view of the use of vigorous military force is that it ought to be rationally oriented toward the goal uh, of, of, the, of the state engaged in war. Now the stragglers straggling behind, scooping up hams and, uh, uh, and running amok, this is dangerous and uncivilized behavior. He's thinking of Napoleon. Armies are dangerous things. They can produce uh, dangerous uh, revolutions. Uh, soldiers need to be tightly controlled. The part that he's okay with is the part that I think comes down to us as part of Sherman's legacy, mm -hmm. which is vigorously applying force to the enemy uh, and, and doing so in a way that's designed to win the war without regard to niceties or, uh, or, or humanitarian constraint in the first instance. Burning uh, their property, destroying their property, the transportation. That's right. so, so, so long as there's a military project and it's not wanton and willful, then Lieber thinks this, as a controlled application of force, is something that we ought to do to bring the war to us to a speedy conclusion. It's it's uh, the line that David read to you earlier about vigorous wars being better in the uh, uh, in, in the long run. Uh, so so I think that's the the ambiguous uh, lesson. I think historians, you know, Lieber is one of the great forgotten characters of the Civil War. He's not someone who's uh, uh, written about. You won't find him in, in the index to McPherson's uh, Battle Cry of Freedom. It's just one useful shorthand for left out of the narrative, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and one of the reasons is, I think historians have long thought, surely this is a sideshow. If Sherman can march to the sea yeah. in 64, yeah. then any talk about humanity and, and constraints in 63 is just, is just a, I mean, it's, just, it's not part of the real story. Uh, but I think once you re-understand Lieber and understand him as part of an emancipation project that takes military necessity at its core, then all of a sudden Sherman looks like he's embodying the project, not in contradiction to it. It makes it a more complicated story about what the law of war means. It's not a morally simple tradition, but it's, um, but it's, but it's one that's, that's in line with, with Lieber. By the way, you haven't mentioned the personal circumstances of Lieber. Uh, he had two sons, one on the Confederate side, one on the Union side. One is killed, one is wounded. Yeah, well, he's had three sons, all of them in the war. Right. One, one killed on the yeah. peninsula, uh, yeah. fighting for the Confederacy. Another loses an arm at Fort Donelson. And the third is a judge advocate throughout the course of the war. He, he asked a question about guerrillas, and I think you should yeah, talk about good. that because, yeah. because it's really important to your book. It's one of the most interesting parts of John's 
book, which is full of interesting, is that the, it's the guerrilla problem in the Mexican War mm -hmm. that causes mm -hmm. Winfield Scott to reintroduce the notion of crime into military law by effectively inventing the notion of a war crime. It's, deals, it's trying to deal with guerrilla warfare, and it becomes a huge issue during the Civil War. And one point to, to uh, sort of, uh, remember here is I think we tend to think that today we have the problem of the unlawful combatant. Once, once upon a time, there were regular armies that fought one another in uniform, and it's only a 21st century problem that we have irregulars. But actually, the irregular problem is the source of much of the law of war going back into the 18th century. It's a problem for Napoleon on the Iberian Peninsula uh, in the uh, first decade of the 19th century, and then it's a problem again in Mexico for the United States, and re returns with a vengeance in places like Missouri uh, in, uh, uh, in the Civil War. So that's a very important part of the story. David Brian Davis. You, you can take the mic right there, David. You don't even have to get up. Oh, okay. It's so important, uh, I want you to use two mics. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I uh, have written a very positive review of uh, Jim Oakes' book for the New York Review of Books. Uh, but there's one issue I didn't have uh, space to, one load off to de deal with that I wanted to raise here. Uh, he, he shows, as people now realize here, that Lincoln's Republican administration <clears throat> was uh, uh, very strongly uh, committed to the goal of undermining uh, and, and destroying slavery. Um, and uh, the First and Second Confiscation Acts uh, really bear this out as, uh, in a very startling way. But Amanda Poorman, in her uh, wonderful new book, uh, A World on Fire, regarding Britain's response to uh, the Civil War, uh, points out that Secretary of State William Seward uh, was, gave, gave prohibitions on Charles Francis Adams, who was our minister or ambassador to England, uh, against in any way indicating that the war uh, was uh, for abolishing slavery. And this is a bit surprising in view of the need to keep Britain from recognizing the Confederacy and that Britain had this strong anti-slavery heritage and, and tradition. Um, uh, but uh, uh, according to uh, Foreman, Adams uh, had to turn away all kinds of uh, Britons who were uh, uh, interested in, in, in getting confirmation that the Union was um, but really against slavery. Right. And indeed, er, early in the war, there was a great amount of anti-union uh, sentiment in, in, in Britain. But the British and poor and anti-slavery society, for example, when they moved away from a pacifist stance and came to uh, Adams, uh, found that uh, he, he couldn't really say anything meaningful to, to, to them. And I, I found this really quite uh, perplexing in, in view of the uh, the theme, themes of your book. The, the only thing I could imagine is that it had something to do uh, with the border states, with not wanting uh, in an international way to be committed to uh, anti-slavery uh, at a time when this might uh, affect the, 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 the border states. Right. Uh, but I, I'm interested in your thoughts here. I would have to go back and reread that passage in Amanda Foreman's book to see exactly what Seward is saying. My off the top of my head response would be to reiterate a point I make throughout the book that, that formally, as Republicans understood it, the Constitution did not allow them to prosecute a war for any purpose other than the restoration of the Union, and they main that, maintained that position throughout. But they also said the war was caused by slavery and that emancipation and attacks on slavery were a legitimate means of suppressing the rebellion. So it could be that Seward was just repeating the standard line, we can't, we can't prosecute a war for any purpose other than the restoration of the Union under the Constitution. And one of the reasons I suspect that's the case is because not of Amanda Foreman's book, but because of Howard Jones's recent book on the diplomatic history of the war, in which he says that there's, based, there's a real constitutional misunderstanding between the Britons and the Americans right from the start of the war. The English didn't understand the limitations, the constitutional limitations that the Republicans understood themselves to be operating under, whereas the Americans never fully understood the degree to which the granting belligerent status or, excuse me, not granting, acknowledging the legitimacy of the blockade effectively 
protected the North more than it protected the South. So that this misunderstanding that he sees there would fit into what Seward said. He's telling Charles Francis Adams, you can't say ever that the purpose of this war is anything other than the restoration of the Union. Lincoln even says that in 1864 in his annual address to Congress, the purpose of this war is always the restoration of the Union. Therefore, I suggest that Congress take up the 13th, the 13th Amendment again. So on the one hand, he's saying it's the purpose can't be anything other than the restoration of the Union. On the other hand, let's get rid of slavery completely because that's what caused the war. It could be that, but I'd have to go back and look at what Seward was saying. Seward is, uh, uh, Seward is too clever by half most of the time, often, and it's very tricky to figure out what he's up to at any given time. Next question. Uh, well, this, this young man, yeah, okay. Uh, hurry, hurry to the mic. Yes. So the, the post-war court in Texas v. White held that the southern states had never effectively seceded and that they were in effect just in open rebellion against the Union. So then were the southerners still entitled to the Fifth Amendment protections of the takings clause or did military necessity, like you talked about, justify the violation of the takings clause without just compensation for the private property loss? I think this is a great question because what it does is it gets right, it, it forces us to ask what the role of law is in moments of armed conflict, uh, in moments of civil war in particular. Uh, my inclination is to think um, that it's, a, it's a, a, a lawyer's bad habit to try to make these things all connect up and make them coherent. Uh, I think that the, the the Lincoln administration, and actually Lincoln himself comes to have a very sophisticated view along just the lines I'm, I'll, I'll lay out here. The Lincoln administration comes to think of the law as a mechanism, a tool for accomplishing ends. Uh, it's not a, 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 a body of autonomous principles that need to be reconciled with one another. It's something that's going to help them win the war. Uh, now, that puts constraints on the things they do. It's not just a tool you can do any old thing with. Uh, it would, in fact, it wouldn't be useful unless it had some internal integrity uh, uh, as, as, as law. But it doesn't mean that, that uh, it means that we don't really have to ask questions about whether or not post-war views of the law matched up with the conduct of the Lincoln administration during the war. The project wasn't to create a perfectly coherent body of principles. It was to create a body of, of policies that would have legitimacy, both in the eyes of the northern constituencies for the Republican Party uh, and in the international eyes, uh, the eyes of the British and the French. Um, and so, I, so I, I'm tempted to think that these, these kinds of questions are the kinds of questions that have caused historians to think that law is a relative sideshow. Because it can't be that Texas versus white determines whether some confiscation in the South in 1863 was permissible or not. It just, it just can't be. It's a kind of lawyer's, uh, uh, lawyer's preoccupation. But if we re-understand the law as a practical tool, a social tool for accomplishing things, uh, then all of a sudden uh, the legal history of the Civil War seems important and interesting again. I, I agree. I had the same experience when I would, uh, in discussing this stuff with friends of mine over the years that uh, they would say, but I would say, look, they're all, all operating within the constraints of the Constitution. They believe themselves that the Constitution doesn't allow us to abolish slavery and say where it exists. Every Republican says that. All anti-slavery people say that. Everybody says that, right? So they're operating within this constraint and you can't understand how they intend to go about attacking slavery except within that constraint. On the other hand, they're very ingenious about working within that constraint to get a lot more done than you would have thought you could get done. So you can't abandon the notion of that the law constrains. On the other hand, you can't, you can't assume that it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, it wraps people up and makes them immobile. Right? Rebecca Scott. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. Thank you. Uh, this is a question that perhaps goes right to the point of ingenuity versus coherence. So early on in your book, uh, Jim Oaks, you introduced the very interesting distinction that you think was crucial to anti-slavery constitutionalism, the notion that the Constitution and the nation did not actually fully recognize property rights in persons constituting slavery as such. But if I understand your argument correctly, it obliged the nation to recognize the status of slave insofar as a state law recognized a property right in the person. Is, have I got the distinction about the way 
You'd, so you make it. That slaves you make are a property stat under state law, but not recognized as property under, under the Constitution. Right. Yes. But, but you then persons would, held in service. Right. right. But you would then argue that, for all practical purposes, up to a certain moment, recognizing that the person holds the status of slave under state law looks an awful lot like recognizing that the person is subject to a property right. So I guess what I'm asking is, I found when, when I first read your discussion of anti-slavery constitutionalism, I thought, oh, this is wonderful, right? Here's a way of slicing apart the question, where does the title to a person as property actually lie? But I've been struggling since then to figure out exactly what work the idea of recognizing the status but not the property, what work exactly does it do to call it status? Do we, what distance do the anti-slavery constitutionalists get from, you see what I'm saying? What's, what daylight do they open up? It allows for a national anti-slavery politics based on the notion that you could kill slavery by surrounding it rather than destroying it within the states. And that that's a series of policies that are not really on the table in national politics until the 1840s and 18, really the 1850s. And that's a lot of different things. It's, mm -hmm. it's abolishing slavery in Washington, D.C. It's refusing federal enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Clause. It's, it's abolishing slavery in the territories. And it may mean a lot more things besides that. It may mean uh, uh, not recognizing slavery in any areas that the federal government controls within the southern states. It may mean regulating the coast slave trade, it may even mean regulating to death the interstate slave trade, but it, it doesn't allow the federal government to abolish slavery in a state where it exists, but it does allow the federal government to pursue policies aimed at the ultimate extinction of slavery by surrounding it with what they called a cordon of freedom. That's not there. That's not there in 18, 1790, 1800, and 1810, 20, 30. It's starting to be on the table by 1840, and it's the dominant position of the Republican Party in 1860. So that the, the Republican Party platform in 1860 says, and this is where I think, where I, again, I still disagree with John about the significance of the Somerset position. The Republican Party platform says, the normal condition of the territories is freedom. Right? That's a Somerset premise, right? Absent a positive law, the normal condition of anyone enslaving someone or declaring a property right, the normal condition of someone is, is freedom. And I think that's, it allows for a kind of national anti-slavery politics that isn't there, isn't there otherwise, I think. Whether it would have worked, I don't know. But <laughs> Sarah, you're going to have to run to the mic. Sorry. Hey. Get your workout in. Sarah Bohm. That was my goal. Um, Professor Oakes, this is a question that is somewhat related to where the end, that just uh, ended, which is you mentioned at the beginning um, that you discovered in your book more anti-slavery origins of the Civil War and more anti-slavery in the Republican Party. And I guess going off what was just said, if you could elaborate on that, um, especially the sort of tensions in the Republican Party between the free soil idea and the anti-slavery idea, or the reconcilability of those? The irreconcilability? I don't think there are. Or, no, or the reconcilability oh, there, I of think those. they are reconcilable. I think they're the same thing, right. basically. Um, well, I, I, I think that historians of abolitionism have spent way too much time uh, fixating on what I call the cult of true radicalism. Figuring out, uh, uh, figuring out who's the truest of the radicals, who's the most radical, and in the process actually narrowing down the definition of what uh, anti-slavery radicalism is to the point where we're down to John Brown, you know, or something like that, you know. And the effect is He'll to have his own the, the effect <laughs> is the effect has been to miss the degree to which a broad anti-slavery sentiment has been there for a very long time that you can trace in congressional votes back to 1790, right? It's always the South votes unanimously and gets a third of the Northern votes, and that's what allows it to constantly beat back a Northern anti-slavery majority that you see in congressional votes, with the exception of the 1830s, fairly consistently, right? And then the question of the origin of the Civil War becomes, how do you shift the balance of power until that Northern majority can do something, right? But, but you don't get until the 1830s, as I was answering uh, Rebecca's question, you don't, what, what, what seems to me to shift in the 1830s, what the second wave of abolitionism is all about, is the notion that uh, it's not going to happen anymore 
on a strictly state-by-state -state basis, not that it, it, it's still going to have to be done by the states, but that the federal government can do things, can undertake an anti-slavery project that is designed to get the states to abolish slavery. That's a national anti-slavery politics that is hard to see coherently in any way. There are pieces of it in place after the revolution, but as, as a coherent body of thought and a coherent set of policies, that doesn't really come into existence until the second wave of abolition. It is, I think, what second wave of abolitionism ultimately is all about and why you see it being formulated in the late 1830s and in place in a series of platforms, the Liberty Party platform, the Free Soil platform, and ultimately the Republican Party platform. So, but so, Jim, Jim yeah. look, let me push you a bit on that okay. before Joe Yanelli does. Um, whether we call them radicals or moderates or whatever, the, the abolitionism of the Republican Party, let's say by 1863, is in part made by the war. Oh, yes. It's made by the war. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, and you show that. Um, so, if, but, but if this... Not exclusively, not by exclusively. the way. Not exclusively. So it's not simply... Their theory of accord, cordoning off slavery, their theory that, that right. slaves are humans it's and persons... It's not what, what Gary Gallagher did I don't know whether it was on this stage or not, but uh, you were here, and yeah, he was, was here, was. and That's it was why on I invited stage. him. Uh, it's, Gary it's, always comes it's through. It's not that, but. you know, the Civil War is not a plue perfect example of things happening that absolutely no one could have imagined in 1861. Okay, but about all I'm really asking, of course, you know what this question is, right. it's, you, you eventually paint all Republicans essentially the same, and that's okay, but if, if, if Republicans were this devoted to this cause, I guess what I want to ask is, why weren't they a bit more prepared for its consequences? That is, I'm not just talking about Reconstruction now, but the consequences of emancipation itself, the, the terrible disease and poverty and death that went on. And I know they, they, can't, they can't be utterly responsible for the scale right. of this war. Right. However, the scale of the war is happening at the same pace as the scale of emancipation. Right. And I they, think were they were not prepared. No, they were. To, I think okay. they were very right. naive about about right. what it was going to take, how long it was going to take, how hard it was going to be, and how brutal it was going to be. Even with they all these said, predictions, even with all these, even with all those predictions, I think they underestimated the tenacity of slavery, the, mm. the willing, the, the degree to which this Confederacy was going to fight back. The degree to which, the, the, how hard it was going to be for slaves to get to Union lines. I think they just assumed, coming out of the 18th century, that slavery was intrinsically weak. It was politically weak. It was socially weak. It was economically backward, it was and it was just going to, yeah. it was going to very rapidly it was erode in collapse. the deep south, and then, and then the border states would have to collapse. Well, that's where they come to. That's part of the wartime evolution. Mm -hmm. They don't start out thinking. They start out thinking it's going to go first in the border states and then spread south. But among the many things that changes over the course of the war is that military emancipation, which was the subordinate clause of anti-slavery politics until the war, becomes the dominant. The, the, it, it ceases to be, it becomes the tail that wags the dog, if you will. Well, right? this is one of, the, one of the reasons why I think the law of war can actually help us understand this moment. It's because it's been left out of the story. Because the law of war isn't just empowering the destruction of slavery. It's mm -hmm. also invoking a tradition that has other entailments. Mm -hmm. And among those entailments are limits on the interruption and destruction of an enemy social system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we see in, for example, the, the final Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln urging the slaves, urging the freed people right now because they're freed people, urging them to work for reasonable wages. And you can see in that a vision of a post-war, post-emancipation social regime that isn't turned on its head. Uh, that in fact that that is not turned on its head. I mean, you in many think ways, well, it's both is different from being a slave. Uh, reasonable wages is even better, right? Yeah. Um, but the point is, you can imagine. <laughs> I well, think it's different. I like being paid wages. But if you work, <laughs> it imagines a regime in which agricultural production in the South, on the plantation on which you're currently working, is is the future. That's and so in that sense, maintains the plantation economy moving forward. Now, uh, a, a massive difference, but one in which the law of war's limits on the kinds of convulsive uh, upheaval are, are powerfully and palpably felt. So, that's, so the, the law of war from 
adopting military necessity as the rationale for emancipation is to adopt a rationale that contains limits, not just empowerments, and anticipates some of the limits of the end of the war and... Uh, and and Lieber lives till 1872? 72. 72. Yeah. yeah. And what does he end up thinking about the immediate aftermath? So in the immediate aftermath, his major project is a war crimes project. Right, he's, right, a, right. He's, a, he's in the Confederate archives trying to figure out how Jefferson Davis is attached to the assassination. Yeah, of he goes into the Confederate yeah. archives yeah. trying to prosecute them. He's a war crimes investigator. Right. The, the, um, yeah. he, he I need to write his biography. Yeah. Anyway, I think Lieber's fascinating. He's, it's great. I, I, I would just add one addendum to that and that, that, that I think is very important. And, and, uh, I think is very important, is that military emancipation is not the only anti-slavery policy that the Republicans are pursuing. Mm -hmm. That all along there are these two policies that are interacting in very interesting ways. One is the, the basically peacetime policy of the cordon of freedom surrounding, so aimed at getting loyal states to abolish slavery on their own. This too becomes much more aggressive mm -hmm. because of the war and they can pursue that much more aggressively. And the second point is so that military emancipation isn't the be all and end all of Republican anti-slavery policy. It becomes the most important engine until 18, late 1862, early 1864, when the focus shifts to a third policy that is not military emancipation and is not the cordon of freedom, and that is ultimately abolishing slavery by means of a constitutional amendment, because neither of those policies is going to be adequate. To, to so why is the 13th Amendment so necessary? Because Beyond the Lincoln movie, which people have seen. Because neither of those policies is adequate. Because, partly because of one of the things you said, that military emancipation turned out to be basically uh, unmanageable. Right? Mm -hmm. They only take a fraction of the slave population and yet they are overwhelmed, overwhelmed oh, 15 by the fraction, maybe. yeah, 15 percent, by the best numbers we have. I don't know if, if anybody's got better numbers than that, but those I think are the best numbers we have. Of the four million slaves, about? 15 percent are freed by the war. 500 600,000. Yeah, 525, something like that. Anyone. Right. Or by the end of the war. By the end of the war. Which so that's 15 percent. most slaves are not legally liberated. Right. Until 1865, even the end of 1865. Right. Right. And so it's, it's inadequate. And the, the, as, as I put it, the paradox of military emancipation is that it, it can only free a relatively small fraction of the slaves, and yet the Union Army is completely overwhelmed by those numbers. Yeah. It simply cannot deal with hundreds of thousands of contraband, and the camps are horrible and like yeah. that. So, and I don't think anybody imagined that as a problem. Hmm. Maybe they should what have, did they? but they didn't. Is there any evidence of what they actually, did anyone have a, an immediate post-emancipation vision among the Republicans? Other than the uh, free labor vision of an idealized free yeah. labor society. Go to work for wages. So. Well, not just go to work for wages. I mean, it's more than that. Your families are legal. There's yeah, no yeah. slave trade. There's no yeah. domestic. And maybe mandatory. I mean, that's the, that is, that is, the, this is the complicated family life of the immediate Emancipation, uh, post-emancipation is you, you're you're allowed to be in a family, but you kind of have to be in one too. That, that's the the double the double flip of it. But 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 family life is no longer uh, illegal. Uh, educating black people is no longer illegal. There's schools now. It's the opposite. You know, there's more freedom of mobility. I mean, otherwise, nothing that happens in the post-war South makes sense. Things like that. If there isn't massive mobility from year to year of the, of the former slave population. So that lots of things happen that transform the social system, even though it's still a plantation-based economy. We'll take one more question here from Joe Yanelli, an abolition historian. Watch out. Uh, excuse me, I'm funny and cold. Um, OK, so I think the, the cult of true radicalism is a very fair critique. Um, but I think that there's also a, um, a cult of Lincoln that you can point to that makes the opposite sin. Yeah, I um, and I think what's really interesting is where the two kind of talk to each other and influence each other. Mm. Um, and um, I'm interested in this notion of slavery as war, as a state of war. And I've seen it as early as 1839 with the Amistad slave revolt. Abolitionists were saying slavery is war. Um, John Brown is saying it in the 1850s, slavery is war. And I think you can see it in Lincoln, too. Uh, every drop of, of blood drawn uh, with the lash will be repaid with the sword. Um, and I'm wondering if either of you found um, evidence of this idea that slavery is itself a state of warfare in, in your work. Well, it's in Locke, right? Right, it's a 17th century it's, it's idea. A, I mean, it's, it's Locke. Um, it's the slavery is defined as the state of war continued. And you see it in the late 18th century, people talking that way. You see it in Grotius and, yeah. and, in, and in Locke. I mean, and it's part of the reason why the slave insurrection fear is such a, such a deeply ingrained anxiety. Because it means if hot war breaks out, 
in the, essentially the Cold War that is the Southern plantation, uh, the, the fear is that the, the warfare between slave owner and slave will resume, uh, and resume at just a moment when uh, white men are away from plantations in uh, unprecedented numbers. I'm going to ask both of you one last question and ask for relatively succinct answers. It's an impossible question, but since it's what you've written these big books about, after you've written these two books, how does this make you reflect on war as an engine of history, the way war makes and unmakes history? You go first. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you know, that's kind of what this is about. I think there it's is a Skip Stout style question. He wasn't asking no, it, good. so I did. In um, <laughs> in both of these books, and uh, and and in a bunch of other uh, books that have come out uh, in the last year or two, um, I, I think you see the return of war as uh, as a central category in American history. Um, I think that that's maybe a longer trend than just a year or two. That, that's um, uh, so. War is is resurgent as an explanatory mechanism, but I think that the other thing going on in both of these books, and I know it's at, I know it's at the heart of mine. I think it's in, uh, really at the heart of uh, Jim's as well. Is that war isn't just a state of exception? It turns out that war comes with a whole body of ideas, principles, norms, rituals that aren't just reducible to brute force. So that when you move across the peace war boundary, you're not moving into an unconstrained space of violence. Uh, There is lots of violence. Uh, I don't want to diminish that for one minute. But that violence is understood by the societies engaged in it as a form of meaning making and comes with a set of legitimating principles. And that's why the legal history of the war, the political history of the war uh, is still so important because you can't make sense of the sheer violence. Sherman to the sea is not just the, the, the total war debate that happened you know, in the last couple decades, uh, really a, a, a misnomer. Uh, because there is, it is not total war. It is war deeply saturated in principles and ideas and norms, which are hotly contested and now contested you know, in a hot war sense, not just in a, in a, in a debating society sense. So I, so I would say that uh, you know, war is extraordinarily important, but it's a continuation of law and politics by other means. It's, uh, it's a continuation oh, yeah, you like that. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a continuation of... of um, of, uh, of, of the same kinds of, of, of contests over ideals mm. that we see outside of it. I don't know that I have any generalizations about war in, the, in, in general. The, what this book made me appreciate more than ever is uh, this uh, is the, nece- the, the tragic necessity of the war, right? That, that, mm. uh, that I can't imagine slavery Slavery proved so tenacious, it was so hard to uproot, that it's inconceivable to me that it it could have been gotten rid of any other way except by means of the war. And I was strongly influenced by, and I can't even find it, an essay or a passage you wrote some years ago, uh, David, David Davis wrote, in which he speculated that if the South had won or it main, managed to maintain its independence, there's a very good chance that Cuba would not have abolished slavery and Brazil might not have abolished slavery and we wouldn't talk about, I say it, I, maybe we wouldn't even be talking about an age of emancipation. So, so it's hard for me to imagine how that could happen without war, right, without war, not, and, and a horrible war, a horrible, destructive, brutal war, but that uh, a tragically necessary war if you think slavery is something that needed to go, that should have gone. There's a moral abomination, if you will. Mm-hmm. Shall we have a vote on that, do you think? I don't, I don't I think it's a resolvable issue. In the 21st right? century, we probably shouldn't have a vote on that. Well. On that note, uh, that, that, thank you. That was, those are amazing you. answers. To the thank you. It was, it was wonderful. Okay. Thank you all for coming, and you simply must now read these two books. <laughs>